asked to talk about what regulatory programs mean to the poultry industry. And when I first, uh, when that was first discussed, I was like, okay, I had a few topics in mind. And then as I started thinking, more and more and more things came to my mind. Um, when you look at state and federal type regulatory, pro regulatory issues within the industry, it just, I could stand here for three hours probably and still not finish <laughs> some of the, the ways that it affects the industry. So what I decided to do is focus on broilers. So I'm going to focus predominantly on broilers, which is the type of company that I work for. Keystone Foods is a, a broiler integrator. Uh, we have three complexes, as Ray mentioned, and we're owned by a Brazilian company called Marfrig. Um, and so for this talk, we'll be predominantly um, focused on, on broilers, but just keep in mind there's a lot of regulations on the turkeys and the layer, commercial layer side as well. Um, I'm going to cover two areas. Obviously, most of my work is in live operations. I visit the different complexes and go to the different farms. So most of my experience is going to be in live operations. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the regulatory issues we deal with on a daily, weekly basis there. And then I'll touch a little bit on some of the food safety issues in the processing plant, predominantly salmonella, and also a little bit on animal welfare. So for live operations, as Dr. Klein mentioned, NPIP is the National Poultry Improvement Plan. This is, uh, was a plan designed in order to create an industry and state program that allowed to uh, survey the uh, birds that were moving across state lines and also at that time when it was originally uh, initiated in the mailing system. And um, there was a need for some type of national criteria and standardization for disease control and surveillance. Um, and it started off as a state program uh, for salmonella pylorum testing in the 20s. And it originally started off for diseases that were easily transmitted vertically from the hen, breeder hen through the egg to the broiler. Now MPIP is a huge program with over 95% of the U.S. Uh, industry participating. And it's a voluntary program, which makes it a unique program. It is voluntary, so the industry, you have the option if you want to participate. Um, and the, the plan primarily focuses for broilers on avian influenza, mycoplasma, and salmonella testing. And um, as I mentioned, it was previously uh, designed for vertically transmitted diseases, but with the height of avian influenza in 2006, it became a significant issue, and MPIP adopted that. There's many different provisions. Um, it's developed jointly by industry, state, and the federal government, as I mentioned earlier. And you have to have certifications in order to move poultry across states. So um, that's one of the uh, components of it. It's, each state has its own facility that or each um, uh, administered MPIP official state department. And the state's requirements have at least the minimal of the national requirements. And then each state has its option to have more strict requirements. For example, Alabama has heightened uh, larger number of surveillance than the uh, federal MPIP program does. There's also a general conference committee. Uh, this committee is uh, basically oversight um, the, the MPIP program. It consists of members of USDA. It has a member at large, um, which could be anyone from industry, government, uh, state, um, and then elected member from each of the six different regions. So it's broken up into six areas of the country. And then there's a conference that is held biannually every other year, um, in which uh, different programs are voted on and discussed at that time to make changes to the program. And just a little bit about laboratory diagnostics. I'm not going to really go into this, but the, the laboratories are, are critical for maintaining this program, as Dr. Klein mentioned. Uh, the state laboratories do a lot of the testing, but there also are some private laboratories, so that with the broiler integrators have their own laboratories where they do this testing. Um, but the USDA labs provide all the antigens, all the test kits, everything for, uh, to, to keep the uh, approved tests running within the lab facilities. And they also do um, annual audits and teaching. There's different classifications. Some of the ones that I'm going to discuss a little bit about are MG, MS, the clean and the monitored program. It's mycoplasma, gal galaseptica, and synovia, and then also the salmonella monitored, including SE and just regular salmonella, and then avian influenza. This, is, as uh, Dr. Klein mentioned, this surveillance is incredibly important to our industry. We are a very, very large industry, um, and the state of Alabama has a lot of poultry, 
And so it's very, very critical to have an early warning system for us, whether it be avian influenza, mycoplasma, um, any of the other diseases. And what's been really unique about the MPIP is it has created, um, and with the avian influenza, it's created a lot of uh, state uh, animal health advisory boards, which really has brought a lot of the industry together to talk on a pretty routine basis, whereas normally before that we may, we may not normally do that. In the midst of that, we also talk about other disease issues that may not be in PIP specific, such as laryngotracheitis or bronchitis or reovirus, anytime there's a health issue. Um, it provides the intelligence to prevent introduction and spread of disease. And it does provide the earlier detection, which hopefully will lead to earlier eradication. And it has timely serology testing. Most of the program is serological testing. Um, and then that can lead to further diagnostics if needed. So just a little bit about MPIP and how it's broken down. The primary breeders are going to be the genetic poultry breeding stock. So that's going to be your avigens, your uh, cobs, your um, heritage, your hubbard. And then the vertical integrators are the multipliers. And in that category, there's the parent breeder stock and the rulers. So this is, ooh, that didn't turn out like I thought it was going to. But um, this is just a hierarchy of how the flow of the birds go. It goes from the primary breeders all the way down into the further processing. And then um, this is the vertical integration. So the broiling industry is very vertically integrated, as I think you guys know. So uh, we have a lot of control steps in there, which is really good. So the MG and the MS, we do a lot of serology to be MG clean. This is just an example. Um, a multiplier such as us, in order just to qualify, we have to test 150 birds by four months of age, and a flock would be considered uh, a farm. In some instances, it's considered a house, uh, depending on which category you're looking at. And then you monitor. Um, and then these, the, the, the results are reported back to the MPIP. And then those states have reporting of the diseases to the industry. So if there's a mycoplasma that is showing clinical signs, they will make the industry aware of that. So it's a, a very good working system for us. This is just another example of the different testings that's done at different levels um, of the industry, but there's uh, a lot of sampling done. There's also a mycoplasma monitored, which is slightly less numbers, but constant monitoring of the program. And I'll go into a little more detail on, on costs in just a second. Avian influenza, basically low path H5H7. Um, it includes any low path H5H7 that um, and the states must, must have a plan for this. So each individual state has to have an MPIP approved low path H5H7 plan. And these take a lot of time. Uh, they only, not only take a lot of time to initially implement, but they also take a lot of time on an annual basis to keep updated, moving with technology and changes that may have occurred either based on an incidence that happened and experiences learning from that or just changes in the regulation. Um, so all states have a low path H5, H7 plan. Um, this has really helped the companies uh, with their own plans. Most companies have their own AI plan in place. And it's, it's nice to have the state plans with MPIP because it helps us guide us to how our plans would work. So our company plans now for most companies are very similar to what the state plan is. Um, and it really works well together um, the states and the federal with the industry, so we're all on the same page. Um, we have meetings, we have tabletops, which are very beneficial, not only for the exercise, but also get to meet people within the industry on the state and the local level. And then most states also have a low path non-H5, H7, and that is not necessarily in PIP. That's just a, a different avian influenza plan. So with the control of this, there's cooperation between the states. Um, that's ongoing right now. We're trying to get more states to communicate and review plans together. Right, Ray? We're trying to do that in the process because there's a lot of companies that overlap. For example, our Kentucky operation has birth in Tennessee and Kentucky. So we have to have some type of cooperative agreements between the two in case there was an issue that could occur, that would occur. It's helpful. Um, these low path plans have um, indemnity that's funded by the government. C&D, disposal, everywhere, uh, incident command site system of how everything would flow if there was an occurrence. And this is very beneficial to the industry in, in ways that it takes a lot of time and effort, but if something were to happen, we at least feel like we have a little bit of preparedness. 
Again, avian influenza, the way that we serologically survey for this is the meat type chicken slaughter plants. We test 11 birds per flock, so every farm before it goes to slaughter gets tested um, within 24 days of slaughter. That's a lot of testing. <laughs> And then the egg and meat type birds, they also, which is basically our um, breeders also get tested, basically about the same amount of times that they get tested um, for uh, mycoplasma, but they get tested every, it, they have to be tested by four months of age, and then they get tested every 90 days and then before slaughter. This is all serology. It keeps the labs busy. <laughs> um, and this is just another example of different um, uh, species and how the sampling that they have to take. So this, we also do, a lot of the states also do a lot of the, the uh, backyard flocks, as was mentioned, and that is really, really critical. It's really important to know what's going on in those backyard birds for the commercial industry, and Dr. Klein talked about that, and, and they do a great job of, of helping us establish that relationship um, so they understand the importance of not only finding the diseases in their birds, but also how it relates to our industry. Um, so it's very, very critical, and the, and the labs help with that. Of course, the indemnity is a huge uh, part of the low path H5, H7 plans. Um, you have to have a plan in order to have indemnity, and the indemnity would be if there was a positive flock, uh, the money that not only the grower would get, but also the company for C&D cleaning, because it would be a huge expense. But at the same time, it's a good thing because if the disease were to spread, obviously it would, it would be a detriment to the industry. This is just an example of some of the emergency supplies. Each plan has this inside the program, um, and each state pretty much has <coughs> uh, different companies that may offer different supplies. So one company may have these certain supplies stockpiled. Another company may have another set of um, things stockpiled. So it really helps... Um, that the Poultry Federation of that state also has some responsibilities in this. So it's a really, some of these regulatory pro programs have really brought industry, the Poultry Federations together and the states to help prepare for these types of programs. I already mentioned a little bit about the cooperative agreements and that's ongoing um, state by state for tabletops and just open line of communication. For the big, another big thing would be lab help um, in the case of an outbreak. Um, the Tennessee or the, or the Kentucky labs could help Alabama or and vice versa. <coughs> There's a lot of forms that go into this. Um, this is just one of the serology forms. Every single time a breeder flock gets bled, this form goes to the state lab and then it also goes to MPIP for proof that the blood was taken and that, of the results. There's also a, if we sell hatching eggs, we have, the flocks have to be tested before they can move across state lines. Um, each hatchery gets inspected annually by the MPIP. And um, the, uh, as I mentioned, moving across state lines is a big deal. Um, not only do we move chicks, but we also move broilers. This is just an example of a, ble breeding, a bleeding schedule for a breeder flock. This is one of ours. Basically, we do a lot of bleeding, and this takes a lot of time and a lot of money, um, but we feel like it's worth it. We, we spend a lot of time on our farms taking bleeding, not only from certain farms, but also by house. So we bleed at a day of age for MGMS, then we do again at 10 weeks. So not only are we bleeding from mycoplasma and AI, but other some of the surveillance diseases that Dr. Klein talked about. I get in 18, 26, 36, 42, 50 weeks, and then right before cell. So we do a lot of serology. For example, in our Georgia, our breeder cost, um, we estimate in 2012 that um, our annual breeder cost just on serology. This isn't supplies. This is, this is just straight lab fees. Straight lab fees for AI and mycoplasma is about $5,500. That isn't counting the time that it goes out to, to the farms. Kentucky is a little bit more expensive, and the states vary between states based on the amount of funding that they get from their state government. There's also some federal money that goes out, so there's a lot of variation between the states. And so we just, we monitor all of that. Even though if the sampling numbers are similar, the costs are different and they vary by state. And then the AI program for the um, broilers, um, 
for an example in Alabama, it costs us annually about $10,000 just to test for AI, just as a rough estimate. And that's, that's not counting, like I said, supplies, time, going to the farms, transporting it to the lab, etc. Okay, now I'm going to shift a little bit different to something different called the FDA egg safety rule. Um, I'm trying to focus on things that affect us frequently or have fre affected us within the last year or so, and this is one of those items. Um, the egg safety rule requires that all eggs that go to human consumption, including hatching eggs, be 45 degrees within 36 hours of lay. So this is all eggs, including commercial. This was geared towards the commercial table eggs, the eggs that you purchase in the grocery store. But somehow the, the hatching eggs got lumped in with this. And um, the goal of the program is really good. The goal of the program is to reduce salmonella and aridus um, by inhibiting the growth. And um, however, for broiler breeding eggs, um, you will basically kill the embryo. If you, if you cool them down to 45 degrees for any amount of time, you'll kill an embryo. So most of our coal eggs, the eggs that we were not going to be taking to the hatchery, were going to breakers. Um, and so our egg cooler rooms need to be between about 64 to 68, 70 degrees. That's the ideal temperature for an embryo. Well, in order to refurbish or build another room on the farm, it would have cost a lot of money to get those temperatures down to 45 degrees for our coal eggs. So what the industry pretty much decided to do is most of the broiler breeder companies just don't comply with the rule and they no longer have our coal eggs sent to breakers. The eggs used to go to breakers that went through a pasteurization process, which were then killed the salmonella, and then they were gone into other uh, food products for human consumption. Um, now what we're doing is destroying those eggs, and they're going into landfills or off-haul uh, to companies like Animal Proteins. Monetarily, it hasn't been a big that big of a deal for us, but as far as, I know it's significantly hurt some of the egg breakers, and it's kind of it's a pain for us, but it's, other than that, other than it being a nuisance, um, we just found another route for it. So, so that was one of the, the things that we talked about. Now I'm going to get into food safety. So um, MPIP became a food safety program in 89. Um, and when I talk about food safety, I mean specifically salmonella and salmonella aniridides as a human pathogen. And the reason why it became an MPIP issue is because it can be vertically uh, disseminated into the egg, specifically salmonella and aridides. So there is a U.S. Uh, SE Clean program, um, and then this is maintenance of just keeping all the parent stock that are at the uh, primary breeders SE Clean. And this, there's a very vigorous, vigorous, vigorous uh, testing program for this. Um, that way that the day-old breeders that are sold to companies like me are negative. So when we get the birds, they're salmonella, salmonella and aridides negative, which is an effort to uh, reduce our salmonella load into the processing plant, which I'll go into in a minute. So this is the SE Clean. This is for the primary type breeders. They do a lot, a lot of testing. But even though they do all this testing, they realize that it's critical and it's something that basically, if, if we test every single flock that we purchase, if we find an SE flock positive, we will not accept the flock. Or they will have to, you know, it hasn't happened, but we, we basically say we don't want any positive salmonella flocks coming from them. So it's very critical for primary breeders to keep, the, and a lot of them do more than this, much more than this. This is just a minimum. So a lot of testing goes on for the SE Clean for the primaries. I don't believe there's very many um, of the multipliers doing the SE Clean. But there is a sal salmonella sanitation monitors, monitoring that some of the multipliers do do. Um, and then we also do the SE monitoring programs. Um, and this is a new program. Um, that basically took effect in 2010 at the MPIP General Conference Committee meeting and biennial conference. Unfortunately, it takes two, three, four years for those programs to get approved. Um, but the, the point of this program was to have multipliers start doing surveillance for SE on, at the breeding stock level to see what our incidence is out there in the breeding stock. And the reason this is important is to try to produce, reduce salmonella into the plant. 
So even though it has not been approved officially by APHIS, the program has already started in NCC. The National Chemical Council has taken that over to start that program uh, to where we're already starting to do the testing. And basically what it requires is, that, again, it's voluntary, but all the flocks um, get environmental testing at 16 to 18 weeks and then again at 45 weeks. So basically pre-lay and then during lay. And this is just a surveillance to see what is out there. So we're going to do a little processing plant. There's a lot of overlap, especially with food safety, because it goes on both pre-harvest and post-harvest. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, the poultry inspection timeline and some things that have happened recently. Um, this didn't show up either. Um, but it's basically the Poultry and Modernization Act. I'm not sure how many of you guys are, are familiar with that. Um, but here's some of the recent regulatory activities that have gone on. Um, most notably, the newest thing is the Modernization of Poultry Slaughter Rule, or the Modernization Act. Um, and, and this is basically just that and the fact that our salmonella um, incidents and testing verification changed in 2011. So those are two of the biggest things that we're facing right now in the plants. Basically, the incidents changed due to some of the salmonella numbers. They were going down, but the incidence of salmonella aridus is going up. As you can see here, um, salmonella and aridus overall as a percentage of positives is going up, even though the total incidence is going down. So a lot of focus is on SE. And this is again is just showing the increase in percent. These are the new broiler performance standards for 2011. Um, what we used to do and now what we are doing. So there's a lot more sampling, stringent sampling criteria for the plants. The amount of carcass rinses that can be positive are a lot lower. And that puts a lot of pressure um, on live operations as far as trying to bring in birds with low salmonella loads. And then also on the plants by their antimicrobial and their chill washer and their, their washing stations. So from an industry perspective, food safety is not negotiable, and it's an emotional and touches everybody. So, and we know that um, the recall events influence a lot of change. And so some of the recalls that we have had lately, um, within the last few years, have really caused a lot of excitement, not only within the industry, but also regulatory-wise. This is just a graph again showing the vertical integration. And just a little bit about salmonella control and vertical integration. We do have it good in that we, since we are vertically integrated, we can control a lot of the aspects. So we can control the feed, we can control, uh, we know what farms they go to, we know what breeder flock they came from, we know where our ingredient sources came from, and we can Im implement different monitoring, water management type programs um, to help try to obtain good biosecurity, which is a component of salmonella and other diseases. So, in 1984, at the AAAP meeting, there was a symposium on salmonella pre-harvest prevention. And the, the, th the ideas that came out of that is reduce salmonella from breeders, which we know, reduce salmonella on the feed, drinking water sanita sanitation, competitive exclusion, antibiotics vaccination, and farm cleaning and disinfection. So those are the highlights. Thirty years later now, they're the exact same thing. We don't know what else to do in the field. So we're trying to use all the resources that we have to try to do this. And why is this? Well, because foodborne illness and salmonella serotypes are not host-specific in species. Host-specific species in chickens. They are just as likely to get salmonella enteritidis as they are to get salmonella Kentucky or some of the non-human pathogen salmonellas. So it's really, really difficult to control salmonella because it's a natural host of the bird. Um, there is an age susceptibility, we do know that, and we do know that va vaccinations can help. But there's no silver, silver bullet. There's only aids that we can do to reduce the load coming into the plant, and they are very, very expensive. Most of the industry lose, uses now live vaccines and Bactrin vaccines within their bre breeder stock. Um, these vaccines cost anywhere from $5 a thousand to uh, $80 a thousand um, for, uh, that's per thousand birds, and they're given at least twice, sometimes three times. Um, and they do do a good job in helping redu reducing the loads, but they don't eliminate the salmonella. There's other things, competitive exclusions, probiotics, organic acids, lots of other things that we can implement. 
and I'm not going to go through this a lot, but basically you've got to have two live, pro two live vaccines and two killed pro vaccines really to even try to get any positive reduction um, in the salmonella just because it is such a common, common normal floor within the gut of birds. And it's going to take about a year before you see any results in the broilers. So if I start a program today, I can, it's going to take about a year before I can see any indication of change. See, a lot of companies use CE, we use CE in addition to our um, program, and now there's a lot more direct fed microbials and probiotics on the market that are being used to try to prevent colonization of the bacteria. Feed withdrawal is a huge issue. Feed withdrawal is one of those necessary evils. You've got to take the broilers off feed before they go to the plant in order to not have fecals throughout your entire plant. But when you take broilers off feed, what's the first thing they start doing? Scrounging in the ground. And so they're going to, that's what the salmonella are going to be, and they're going to pick it up. So the loads of salmonella get pretty high at that time. Also, salmonella intestinal health. One of the largest health issues in the industry right now, other than the real virus and the bronchitis, is gut health. Gut health is a huge issue for us. Um, our, the uh, ionophores that we're using are losing resistance. We haven't got the vaccine thing figured out. And the more coccidia we see, the more necrotic enteritis we see, and the more salmonella we're going to find. So it's, it's, it's a really difficult uh, thing right now. You could be salmonella free until 50 weeks of age and then go positive during feed withdrawal just because of, if there's a low level. They had a coccidia issue, the same issue. They could be fine, they have a coccidia right, bam, they're positive. And it's really hard to get rid of it. Salmonella control is very changing, it's a very dynamic uh, population within the houses um, and it varies. One house can be positive one flock, and the next flock can be negative. And a lot of environmental influences influence this that we don't, still don't know a lot about. The Salmonella Initiative Program, or the SIP program, is another program in the plant that's looking at different um, ways to um, establish regulatory waivers, including, including the OLRs in the plants. And these establishments agree to share daily and weekly microbial de testing between USDA and um, with the facility. Um, and this program is ongoing. It has been implemented, um, and a lot of companies are doing this. This is the proposed poultry slaughter rule. Um, it has not gone into final ruling yet, but basically this reduces the role of online inspection personnel and saves the agency money. Um, most, for the most part, the industry is supportive of this. Um, it increases the infinite of offline inspection activities, and it increases the actual establishment or the plant's responsibility for the carcass sorting and some of the roles that USDA used to do. It increases establish, um, the responsibility for the pathogen loads as well in the sampling, um, and it also can change line speeds. Um, and we're still waiting on the final ruling. The comment period closed last fall, and we still don't know for sure. But um, basically, what we, the, the way the industry feels, the system reflects an agency determination that physical observation, just by looking at birds on the line, does not have any indication for food safety. And so, it is, uh, the proposed rule is not, is not um, mandatory, and it would change a lot of the way that the inspectors um, are on the line. So, in other words, each line would only have one FSIS inspector, which now they have three to four. Um, so it would really change the way that we inspect the birds. Mainly looking at it not from a disease perspective, but it truly just looking at food safety issues. Because most of the disease issues in poultry are not related to food safety. They're not related to food safety. Um, so the regulatory implications, this would eliminate prescriptive time temperature requirements of chilling carcasses and the maximum temperature for processing. It would amend the reprocessing regulation. It would remove the requirement for generic E. coli testing. Um, and it would remove the salmonella performance standard and performance as we currently know it. And it also removes the finished products. The offline inspectors would increase offline staffing. And they could focus more on things like document review, hands-on verification, fecal, sanitary dressing, those types of things. 
So what would the establishment responsibilities be? Basically, we would provide new online station, online carcass inspection would be done by us, um, and then USDA would be able to do other things in the plant that are most for, more, for, more focused on food safety specifically. So how does, what are the benefits that we see? The increased productivity establishments, we're estimating a 6% um, increase in throughput for savings for the industry, and that's of approximately three cents per bird. Um, reduction in illness cost annually for salmonella and campy because the USDA can focus more on food safety issues. Um, obviously, there's a budgetary savings to FSIS. It would cost the industry a little bit more money just because the hiring, we'd have to put more people on the lines and doing things that USDA um, normally was on the line helping with. There are some potential issues with this, which I believe has been worked out during the uh, comment period, and so we are still just waiting on the finalization. Um, I think overall it's a very positive thing from the industry's perspective. Um, it allows us to focus on areas that we need to focus more on than, because bird health is relatively good, um, and bird health is not necessarily a food safety issue. The SIP will maintain viable. Um, there's also some talk of air chilling proposed, which is already being done in other countries pretty commonly. And the sanitary dressing procedures also is a new program that's being uh, suggested, so it's just kind of in the buzz right now. And then just a little bit on animal welfare. Animal welfare is a huge issue for the industry, something that we really, really focus on, and now USDA has become more of a role in the um, processing plants with animal welfare. Um, so basically, even though we do four audits minimally, full complex audits a year, we do plant audits on every shift, USDA having that presence in there actually is a benefit to help um, not only with our customers, but it gives us some extra eyes and ears. One other issue that we've had is just cadavers. Um, and this is one of the issues that goes back to um, animal welfare, and it's some issues that we just need to work through. Um, cadavers are a huge red flag um, for our customers and also for USDA. And um, cadavers are basically birds that have died other than slaughter. Um, a lot of companies now have cameras going into the not only the scalding tanks, but anywhere where there's live birds to be sure that birds are dead before they go into the skull tanks. Um, so cadavers are something that we watch very closely, and we're working very closely with the USDA and uh, uh, veterinarians uh, to work through some of the cadaver issues and, and some of the definitions of the way that a cadaver is explained um, isn't necessarily what we're finding now that we know that the heads are coming off, we know that the birds are not, are, are, have bled out. Um, and that's, so that's one issue that we're, we're constantly evaluating.